Hi, my name is Jared Ross. I'm one of the medical legal advisors uh, at the MDU. A very warm welcome to all of you and thanks for joining us. Um, I'm joined today by my colleagues Claire Sweeney and uh, Sam Bell uh, and we're going to spend the next hour talking about good practice in complaints handling and importantly where you can turn to for support. This session is being recorded and will be made available to you on watch on demand and if you look at the panel um, uh, to the right of the screen you can see that there's a, a drop down for questions and we'd be really grateful if you had any questions if you pop them in there. The clearer and shorter your questions are the, the greater the chance that we're going to be able to get them and do our best to to answer them for you. We're going to have a Q&A at the end and we're going to address as many of them as possible. Um, there is some um, also advice on the website um, about complaint handling which you can have a look at and I'll be talking about the resources available uh, at the end. At the end of um, the uh, webinar you'll be emailed uh, or so should I say it's towards uh, this week you'll be in, uh, emailed a certificate of attendance uh, for the webinar. Okay. When you give your feedback, there's one extra question that I'd like to know about, and it's really for the practice managers in the audience. I know we've got a mixed group of people here today. There's consultants, there's GPs, and there's practice managers. I'm thinking about setting up a, a workshop for some practice managers um, at the end of you. So if, if any of the practice managers are interested in that, they can just pop that in the feedback. That would be, that'd be really helpful. So what we're going to talk about today is the, the frequency of complaints, the impact, the importance, how we recognise complaints, acknowledging, investigating a complaint, uh, responding, planning for a meeting and what to do with complaints not resolved. Now this is going, the impact of these various things are going to differ between the different groups of people because for a high proportion of the audience you're going to be consultants in practice or doctors working in a hospital and therefore uh, the, the acknowledgement and the investigation of the complaint will be done by other people. If you're in a GP, if you're a practice manager, you will be running this aspect of management of the complaint. But just because some of the investigation aspects uh, don't apply to the consultants, do remember that the overall thrust of dealing with the complaints does apply. So please don't switch off completely during those bits and, and uh, we'll come on to uh, answering and, and dealing with complaints. Well, the extra thing that I haven't put in the slide here is the Ombudsman, and the Ombudsman is something I'll be coming to towards the end of the talk. It's a, The Ombudsman is the secondary review of complaints that occurs in all the nations of the UK. There, there are various Ombudsmen, but the in, in England, the Parliamentary and Health Services Ombudsman has recently uh, is, re, is currently trialling some new guidance on how to manage complaints. And, What's useful about that guidance, although it's currently in draft, is it gives you an idea as practitioners of what the Ombudsman expects um, from responsible bodies managing um, complaints. And I think it's particularly useful if you're involved in, in writing the complaint process and trying to avoid the, the, all the stress associated with being investigated by the Ombudsman or having a complaint investigated by the Ombudsman. So, Come on to that towards the end. So there's lots of complaints uh, in primary care, 170,000 complaints overall um, to the NHS in England, uh, of which 72,000 were about general practice. And in, in primary care, about 34% of all complaints are upheld. And it's much the same in, in secondary care. Again, this is GP complaints, and uh, the, the secondary care complaints are very, very similar to this, but the, the headline is that the, the majority are to do with clinical treatment, as you might expect, but a significant portion of them are to do with communication and values and behaviour uh, of staff. And if you think of both these things as aspects of communication, you can see that communication and how you behave in front of patients uh, comprise a large proportion of the complaints that we see. In primary care, uh, unsurprisingly, there are lots of complaints about appointments and uh, there are also lots of complaints about prescriptions. Now, 
If you go into the um, source for this data, which is the NHS uh, written complaints data, uh, you'll see that the, the um, headline titles I've given there don't completely correlate because I've, I've put together a number of different um, smaller categories to give you an overall picture of what the complaints tend to, to be about. But whenever or whatever they're about, they're very, very stressful and time consuming for patients, for you as doctors involved in them, and for those people having to investigate complaints. We know that they have huge impacts. And if you look here on this, this slide, this is a poll that we did of, of um, our doctors, um, I think last year. And you can see that they, there is significant impact um, or, see, see, uh, or, or um, more than minimal impact on a lot of uh, individuals, particularly doctors in training. Um, I can say as a, uh, an ex-consultant that having a complaint against you didn't, didn't um, become of less importance when you were a consultant, and certainly it was uh, of significant impact to consultants. And GPs there are getting a lot of stress associated with um, complaints, particularly the unre unreasonable complaints behaviour that uh, we see. Um, so we've got some questions about um, about uh, your experience of complaints. And I think, Charlie, can we run those questions now, please? So the first question there is, um, to what extent are you concerned about facing complaints? We're getting a lot of responses there now. So it's split fairly evenly there uh, between um, uh, about 46% being very concerned and 45% somewhat concerned about, about uh, having complaints made about them. Nobody uh, or a very small number not at all concerned or not very concerned. Can we have the next question, please, Charlie? And this is a question about whether you've actually been involved in complaints. And already I can see that a significant portion of you have already been involved in complaints. So you'll have some experience about um, how these things work in your place of work. So it looks like roughly three quarters of you have been involved in complaints already which means I suspect that you'll have seen complaints handled in different ways and you'll have some experience of it, both good and, and bad. Can we have that third question? So this one's about um, the main allegations of, of the complaint. Now, of course, just because of an allegation, and it doesn't mean that the allegation is accurate, that that's actually what happened. Um, but already again, we're starting to see that um, alleged failures in diagnosis or failures in treatment comprise pretty frequent, um, comp uh, frequent uh, issues within complaints that you've faced. What we often see as well in general practice is uh, practice administration issues come out, and that's come out in the in the information we're getting today. Treatment complications frequently, and treatment complications are um, issues that often come out in private practice um, or in surgical practice, uh, rather than um, perhaps as much in, in general practice. In general practice, we see a lot of complaints around delayed referrals or failure, alleged failures to refer. So it's quite an impactful thing if it happens, and, it, and um, a lot of you already have some experience of that personally. And of course, we're often very wrapped up in our jobs. It's taken us a long time to get to the positions in which we find ourselves. And the, and the real concern that 
I have as a medical legal advisor and my colleagues do, is that when there is one complaint, one clinical issue, it can spin off into lots of other things. This is something we call clinic, uh, multiple jeopardy. So if you look at this clinical incident we've got here, um, uh, we're going off into potential for a civil claim. That's certainly something that I used to be concerned about in, in clinical care and clinical practice. But after becoming a, a medical legal advisor, I realized there were lots of other things that could happen and those other things could actually impact upon your work and your position uh, more than uh, a civil suit. So the NHS complaints procedure, um, a coroner's inquest in England, a disciplinary investigation, um, so your trust or, or employers investigating you for what's happened. Very rarely we will see criminal investigations, but they're, they're rare throughout the UK. They're more common in England than other parts of the UK, but they're still pretty rare. Coron um, and then criminal investigation, sorry, and then um, the coroner's inquest, which are a feature of um, things that go wrong resulting in death in uh, England, Wales and, and in Northern Ireland. But the problem is that once one clinical incident occurs, it can spin off into uh, all of these things, often simultaneously, although any criminal investigation will take precedent. So they're important because you are required to respond as doctors, as nurses, to respond to patient concerns. And the, the CQC in England require that all registered care providers are, are able to make sure that people can complain about the care that they've had. But they're important for another reason. And this is often what I try to emphasize with doctors who I'm helping, or my, I know my colleagues do the same, which is that it's a source of learning and a drive for service improvement. So um, it sounds like sort of new age approach to a, a, a complaint that you have to think of as a learning opportunity, but it is actually something that we're very keen on and the GMC are very keen on and the ombudsman is very keen on. The people see that when things go wrong, if they have gone wrong, um, that as an opportunity to change things for the future. Not only uh, um, are you expected to do it, the obligation is there in law and in regulation. So the GMC um, there will expect doctors to cooperate with formal inquiries and complaints procedures. So even if the complaint appears to be uh, de minimis, nothing important, um, it is really important that you engage in it. And this comes on to how we recognize a complaint. I often hear that uh, when a complaint comes in, well, there's nothing in this complaint. This isn't something, there's, it's clearly an unreasonable, unreasonable complaint. And that is true. There are, people are unreasonable at times. People can make unreasonable complaints. But as a regulated professional, that doesn't mean that we can, we can ignore it. And if we look at what NHS England says, a complaint or a concern is an expression of dissatisfaction by an act, omission or decision. Um, either verbal or written, and whether justified or not, it, which requires a response. So even if the um, issue at the basis of the complaint to the trust or to your practice is not a reasonable one, it does require some time to be spent putting together a response, because remember, these things can be reviewed by other people, the GMC, the Ombudsman. And you want to make sure that anything you're writing about a complaint is something you'd be happy for those parties to read. Another myth that we sometimes see is that all formal complaints must be must be made in writing. And of course, that's not true at all. Um, there are two different categories. We've got oral complaints, so which um, can be resolved within one working day to the satisfaction of the complainant. Um, and we've got other complaints that can't be resolved within one day, even if they're oral, they are formal if they can't be resolved and they have to be handled um, in accordance with the regulations. Sometimes doctors will get some feedback and people aren't sure, is this a complaint or not? So in that circumstance, we generally say, why don't you ask the person who's giving you the feedback and ask what they're expecting you to do with the, with the information they've got. For practices, so apologies to consultants in the audience, but for the GPs and for the practice managers uh, in the audience, um, 
it's really important in the practice that um, people who are frontline patient facing are able to recognize and, and start to manage a, a complaint properly. It's good to have them empowered and they should know what to do with somebody who wants to make a complaint. And that conforms with what the PHSO, the Parliamentary Health Services Ombudsman, expects uh, the practice uh, and doctors and their staff to do. They want to listen carefully. They want to confirm the complainant's concerns and the issues which need to be investigated. Ask the complainant what they want to achieve. Is this one that we can resolve straight away or is this one that needs to go into the formal process? It's appropriate also to manage expectations and explain what is possible. What I have seen, and I know my colleagues have too, on lots of occasions, is practices writing back saying, we will respond to this within two weeks, for instance. The reason that becomes a problem is some complaints are more difficult than others to resolve and take longer to investigate sometimes because there's multiple people involved. So if you set an unrealistic target for yourselves, you can make a rod for your own back. But it is important to keep the complaint updated um, explain to them what you're doing, when you expect to be done, and if you're not going to meet your own time scales, then to, to let them know. In hospital, that sort of thing will be managed, hopefully, by the PALS team or, or similar. So I'm just going to run you through a very um, uh, quick complaint. This is in general practice, but I th again, I think that the um, general principles apply um, also within secondary care. It's a patient being discharged from, from hospital with a stoma. Um, there's a question about the referral, um, uh, whether that occurred early enough. Um, there was an issue about prescriptions. And there was an issue about communication about the prescriptions, which the patient had struggled to resolve. So again, if you are in the hospital or a hospital, uh, then you may not be acknowledging the complaint. Of course, if you're in private practice, then you will be acknowledging the complaint and you will have to feedback them what you intend to do. But in, in general practice, you have to acknowledge a complaint within three working days. You have to give the complaint an opportunity to discuss how the complaint will be investigated and uh, when a response will be issued. But it can be more than that, your acknowledgement. So this is um, one, opportunity, one sort of response we sometimes see. We're sorry that you felt the need to complain. We'll respond to your concerns within 10 days. Now, this is already doing, making, I think, probably a rod for their own back in saying that we'll respond in a certain time scale. That might be appropriate, but it, it's quite a tight timescale for dealing with um, a, a complaint. But also it's missing an opportunity. It's missing an opportunity to show some empathy, um, to acknowledge the concern that the patient has. So look at this response um, by comparison to this very short response. We've got a longer response here indicating that empathic touch. Sorry to hear about the, the diagnosis of bowel cancer and your concern. Um, it's, it's highlighting what your understanding of the concern was. Um, giving them a contact detail for speaking to somebody who's handling the, the complaint um, and giving them an idea of when it's likely to be uh, responded to by but also making it clear that if that's not possible, we'll keep them updated. So that starts off, I think, a practice or a doctor responding on, on, on a good in a good place. Acknowledgement is an opportunity for all complaints to set out what's going to be investigated, as we've seen, to deal with issues of consent. Now this comes up very, very frequently in practice and in secondary care. And I think sometimes in, in secondary care, it's kind of glossed over. Um, and probably also in primary care, but remember adults complain for themselves. Adults with capacity should be complaining for themselves, or if they're not complaining for themselves, it should be obvious that they've given consent for somebody else to do it. The fact that the daughter of a patient complains about what's happened to their father doesn't mean that you're obligated to respond. 
you're obligated to check that the father is happy or the parent is happy for that to happen and then there's consent for you to disclose information. In secondary care sometimes I think that doesn't happen so well because of the disconnect between the doctor involved and the PALS team. So it's always worth checking with the PALS team has, have we checked that the patient is okay for us to respond to this. So it's a good opportunity I think to, to steal that issue of consent and to manage the expectations as I think that that letter showed. So this is taken from the current uh, PHSO um, guidelines and if you're not in England uh, don't worry about, the, about me referring to the English guidance because the guidance uh, for the Public Service Ombudsman of Wales for the um, uh, SPSO in Scotland um, it's very very similar uh, to the PHSO guidance. Okay. They set out uh, the PHSO, their guidance, and a thing called Good Complaint Handler. Now, as I said at the very start, that is being updated right now. In fact, they're trialling new guidance in, in some test sites throughout England at the moment. And it's likely this guidance is going to be updated this year. And I'll touch on that towards the end, because there's some important learning information in there, I think. Probably, again, particularly for practices, but not only for practices. So the, the PHO sets out three steps uh, for good complaint handling, and this is step one. The reason that I'm emphasising this is if you're in general practice uh, in England, or if you are in secondary care in England, then um, how a complaint is handled by one of the responsible bodies, so the GP practice or the trust, can be reviewed by the Ombudsman. That can have financial implications for practices in particular, but also for trusts, in that the ombudsman, if they feel a, a complaint has not been handled well, or if they feel that there are outstanding issues which have not been addressed, or if they feel that the um, suffering of the patient was such, they can recommend financial recompense, which in the first instance would come from the practice. So getting it right as far as that is possible early on can save the practice money. And given these straightened times in which we live, uh, I think that's an important thing to remember. Anyway, going back to what they say in Good Complaint Handling, they say it's really important that people listen carefully, obviously, but sometimes it's not done. Um, it's not unusual for complainants not to be able to express themselves clearly or well, their, their writing can sometimes be confused. The information that's there it needs to be teased out of the complaint letter. That's often the reason for confirming with the complainant what their concerns are, what's to be investigated, and what they want to achieve. At the same time as managing their investigations, often, sorry, managing their expectations, often we will see a complaint um, about a relatively minimal issue, and the complainant says, I want this doctor struck off now. Doctors, unfortunately, do get struck, struck off by the GMC, but it's incredibly rare by, the, by, by, by comparison to the, to the significant number of doctors on the medical register. And it's important that it's fed back early to a patient what they can expect from a complaint. So if they're coming into the complaint saying, I expect you to give me £10,000 um, for um, uh, how you've made me feel, it's reasonable, I think, at that point to point out that's not what the complaint process is for. It's to manage your complaint, it's not to give you money back. Um, so explaining the process and what to expect is, is appropriate. Explain how long it will take, but be realistic about that. Don't give yourself a rod for your own back. Agree to update the patient and explain what will happen next. So things we've already talked about is a comprised part of good complaint handling. So let's look at that letter again so we can work out how we're going to investigate this. And I understand that if you're in secondary care, the investigation may be done by other people, but it's important to think about what's in the letter because you as clinicians will know if you're not doing the investigation yourself to whom the investigatory question should be addressed. And often trusts don't know. So we often see one doctor being asked to respond to a complaint when they've really not been terribly involved in the care. And, but they recognise who has been involved. So feeding back to the trust in that circumstance is a, is a good idea. So 
as regards to this primary care complaint, well, how should we be um, managing this? Well, we need to look at the person or the initial consultation about their symptoms. Um, we need to um, look at how the repeat prescription has been handled. We need to look at the interaction with the receptionist and see if there are any improvements that, that could take place. So account from receptionists, account from the doctor involved, and a review of the clinical management. And that's, I think, particularly important. So when you're asked to give a statement about your involvement in a complaint, part of that is going to be um, a detailed explanation in normal English, not, not medical notes speak. If you're an obstetrician or an anaesthetist, not in highly technical language, but in language a patient will understand explaining what you did. But it's also helpful to put in some reflections, particularly if you feel there's some things you might have handled differently. As I said right at the very start, no one expects doctors to get everything right first time. I know it feels that way, they do expect that, but in reality, people realize we are only human and we will make mistakes at times. But the important thing is that you're able to reflect on those mistakes and, and learn from it and demonstrate learning. Okay. Um, the review of the clinical management will also incorporate um, consideration of the of the relevant guidance and input from peers. So that's one of the reasons that it's really important. I think if you're uh, in general practice, that the doctor who is complained about isn't necessarily the person who's writing the complaint response themselves. I mean the whole complaint response. Obviously they're going to have an input, but they're not putting the whole complaint response in. It's important that the complainant understands that you have discussed how the complaint was handled with other people who understand the situation too. The same goes for, for doctors in secondary care. When a complaint comes in, it's good to pause, it's good to talk to a trusted colleague to make sure that you that they have the same sense of the management that you have. There may be a formal review mechanism for complaints within the hospital, a complaints meeting, and that's always a helpful thing to bring complaints to. Um, in terms of the good complaint handling from uh, guidance from the PHSO, when you're talking about investigations, it's important that you share the investigation plan with the patient. So you tell them what you're going to do, so who you're going to speak to, what evidence you're going to gather, what sources of information you're going to use for evaluation. So are you using NICE guidance? Are you using a NICE CKS um, as advice? Are you using the SIGN guidance, whatever? Or is there speciality guidance you're using? That's an important thing to make clear because that gives you an idea of what standards are expected. It's also important to make sure they understand who will be involved in decision making and who's responsible for deciding whether or not a complaint is upheld. And that is relevant for the ombudsman. So they have to, the, at the end of a complaints process, a responsible body has to say whether a complaint is upheld or not. And if a complaint is, is um, uh, not upheld, that has to be made clear to the uh, complainant. The reason a couple of slides ago, I mentioned involving other people in decision making and not necessarily being you, the person involved, writing the complaint response in total, is that um, it's clear then that somebody else has been involved in the decision making. It's not just you doing it by yourself without anybody else's input. So objectivity is an important part of, of complaint responses, and that can be really difficult, particularly when you're annoyed and upset and tired and harassed and got so many other things going on that this complaint forms, it forms a really annoying part of your day, but isn't something you really want to deal with because you've got so much else to do, and I completely recognise that. So on that point of, of being harassed, remember, if you're here, you're likely to be a member of the MDU, we have lots of experience of, of helping doctors manage complaints and we'd be happy to help you, okay? So please do remember that's what we're here for, to try and make this easier, not more difficult for you. In terms of establishing that you've done things uh, objectively, or you've looked at the complaint objectively, it's always worthwhile trying to establish what should have happened, 
with this patient. Um, what did happen? Are they the same thing? Um, you need to give equal weight or try to give equal weight to what a complainant says happened as to what your staff say happened. And I know that's always going to be a bit of a bone of contention, but you have to be objective in what you're saying. So if you've got objective evidence in your, in your, um, for instance, the relevant notes that have been kept about interaction, that's evidence that you can use in your complaint, in your complaint response. But if you are left with um, just two people each saying completely different things about an interaction, then you need to be a little bit more uh, guarded in, in, in how you address that, um, address that complaint. Remember also to make sure that you're making it clear how you're evaluating. I already mentioned guidelines, so tell the patient which guidance that you're, guidance you're using and what the guidance says about their particular situation. Often there are uh, disagreements, source of information are, are, do not accord with each other. So the patient uh, says one thing or the family says one thing and the staff say something different. Hopefully the records that you've kept and the staff have kept will um, back up what the staff have said. Sometimes there isn't a specific record of an interaction or something that you've done in the consultation and that's, you know, records cannot cover every single aspect of every interaction that you have. There's always going to be bits that are, that are, that are missing, but in that situation you can rely on your normal practice. You know, I haven't recorded um, X, I haven't recorded my, my examination of, of, of your uh, abdomen, but in, in the situation you described, it would be my normal practice to, to do why. And if I didn't do it in your case, I'm really sorry. Ultimately, you can't uh, resolve strongly held opinions of what happened without information in the record or information recorded in other ways, for instance, CCTV. All you can do is come to a reasonable judgment based on the information that you have. And um, if the evidence isn't there or can't be reconciled, consider whether it's useful to have a meeting with the complainant, for instance, to talk about things. And that can be within the practice or even secondary care. It can be a useful thing to have a meeting with somebody who's unhappy with the care that they've got. The reason that we want to try and tackle disagreements is because if there is a disagreement, there's more likely to be an external review of the, of the complaint. So here's a comparison of, of um, how um, you might respond. We've reviewed your complaint and all the doctors agreed they would have done the same as Dr. X when you attended in March. So that's sort of something that we sometimes do see. Um, versus, we reviewed your care as a significant event uh, to analyze whether you could have been referred under a, under a two week, two week, week wait. Um, and they've considered the NICE guidance um, and they've made it very clear under what aspect of the NICE guidance the person would be um, considered. So that explains to the patient the external standard that you've used. And then importantly, they've put the um, external standard into the context of the patient or the patient into the context of the external standard. In terms of writing your response, uh, I'm going to go over these quite quickly. It's appropriate to have a, a, an introduction explaining who you are. An expression of empathy early on is, is sensible. I mean, we need to be uh, clear it's best if, you, if you're making an apology that it's a real apology rather than a um, than a false apology, not I'm sorry if you feel something, but I'm sorry that you know that your interaction resulted in, in you feeling that way or we've made you feel that way. An explanation of how you investigate the complaint and then explaining in normal English, particularly for the people who are very specialised, um, explain what happened. So cut, cutting and pasting from the notes is not how we do it uh, and it's not going to be helpful to the patient. Make sure you respond to every single point in the complaint and give your analysis of it. And make sure also you're covering learning points or changes in practice that you will take forward. At the end of the letter, it's important that the complainant understands what they can do if they remain dissatisfied and consider meeting with the complainant too, if necessary, at least offer them that. They should always be given the details of the ombudsman.
So this comes into step three, making and sharing your decision making. So they talk about um, being clear and compassionate, providing evidence, um, setting out what you've done and why you've done it, explain whether or not something went wrong or could have been done differently, be clear about um, any action that you'll take in, in respect of this, and make sure that um, you've told the patient about uh, the ombudsman. I think that meetings with um, complainants can be very helpful. Um, we've got some useful e-learning on the website you may want to have a look at, which sets out how to approach um, meetings with complainant. But the reason for meeting them is to, first of all, why are you meeting? Well, you're trying to address what remains uh, unresolved. You try to meet at a time that suits everybody, and you've got to give enough time um, for people to uh, express their, their feelings about the situation and for you to explain the situation. Recognise, of course, that sometimes you'll need to come back to them at the end of the meeting or a few days afterwards with a written um, response to some of the issues that you may not be able to resolve. Choose an appropriate venue. I well remember as a consultant having a meeting in a, in a room which nurses kept coming into during the meeting, which really disrupted the flow of the discussion. So make sure you've got somewhere private and that you, when you do have the meeting, you've got other people with you to, to take notes of what was discussed. The patient similarly may want to have somebody with them. You don't want to have a patient turning up by themselves and three people sitting in a table like some sort of medical interview. You want to make sure that they feel supported. One minor point here, if they ask to take their solicitor with them, um, it might be reasonable at that point to say you're going to discuss it with the MDU. Uh, agree in advance what's going to be discussed, agree how long you're going to take, agree where it's going to be, and also agree who's going to be chair. After the meeting, summarise things in a letter and reiterate what they can do if they remain dissatisfied. And this is where complaints in England will end up often if people are dissatisfied um, with the uh, attempt at local resolution. So it's the parliamentary and health service onsen. It doesn't apply to private care, it does apply to NHS funded care. There is a private ombudsman as well, or, um, but they are they're not available for all private cases. It depends on whether the private hospital is associated with that uh, ombudsman. Um, the uh, complainant the complaint will be and all the documentation will be reviewed in detail by the PHSO, they'll look at both clinical care and how you've handled the complaint. And we often see issues arising from complaint handling, which is the reason that it's important if you're a person deciding how you're going to handle complaints, that you have a look at the expectations of the Ombudsman before you do your complaints policy or you check your complaints policy against what the Ombudsman think should be there. There's usually an opportunity for you to comment on the, on the uh, intention for the uh, PHSO to investigate, and there's an opportunity to comment on their draft report. And this is important, particularly if there's factual, if there are factual errors in the information that is being given to the Ombudsman. Outcome and recommendations can, include, can be included that them be making an apology, a remedial action or even financial remedy, as I've, I've hinted, and that can be quite a substantial amount of money that practices or trusts are, are being asked to pay. So important to try and get these things right to avoid the ombudsman becoming involved. So if you have an ombudsman case, get some advice. If you are a GP, you're going to want to make sure that you tell NHS resolution about it. There are people who handle GP claims and have done since May 2019. And uh, make sure that um, you've done what you said you would do. That's often where things fall down. Complaint responses go out saying we will do X, Y, and Z, and they end up only having done X and can't evidence anything about Y or Z. So if you say you're going to do something in a response, make sure that it's done. And this goes for any ombudsman. In terms of financial recompense that I've mentioned for in England, that's not something that occurs in, in uh, Wales through the ombudsman at least or in Scotland. Um, 
there is a new NHS complaint standard which is being tested currently and is planned to be rolled out in England. They're helpful. It's worth having a look at this on the uh, PHSO website because there's a model complaints handling procedure. There are lots of sections and specific guidance within that, which I really um, recommend as worth reading for you, because what we're trying to do is to make sure that if a complaint that you're involved in goes to the Ombudsman, you've done everything the way the Ombudsman would expect. Here's an example from their guidance on providing a remedy. Um, they talk about a thing called the three R's. This is an example of useful information that comes from it. They expect um, there'd be some expression of regret, some reason for something for what has gone wrong, why it went wrong, and some remedy. So saying um, you'll do more to, to see what's occurred, you'll put in training in place, you'll provide reassurance that um, the mistake will not be repeated because very, very often complainants are really looking for that to be done rather than uh, are looking for financial recompense, although that does come up from time to time. So in summary, complaints are very frequent. It's important to communicate clearly and inject and investigate objectively. Structured responses and shared learning are really important and be clear about the next steps, including the Ombudsman. There's lots of resources about. I've already mentioned the PHSO in England, but the SPSO in Scotland, the Public Service Ombudsman in Wales, the NIPSO, the Northern Ireland Public Service Ombudsman, also publish information about complaint handling, which I would recommend that you have a look at, and um, they're easy to find on the web. We've got lots and lots of resources available, and I direct you, I think, specifically to the e-learning modules, which I think are particularly helpful and very detailed about writing a response, how holding meetings, what to expect in the PHSO, and complaint handling in primary care. There's also secondary care information there too. We've got face-to-face -face learning, and um, both our GPLMs and our HLMs can come into practices or into hospital and talk to doctors and groups of doctors or other staff about complaints and, and management of them. And on top of that, most of you are going to be MBU members. Um, all of us as medical legal advisors have dealt with a lot of complaints in our time at the NDU and we've got lots of experience of, of difficult complainants. Um, and difficult situations for doctors, we're always happy to offer advice. That's what we're here for. Um, I think at this, this point, what we're going to do is have a look at some of the questions. Um, Sam and um, Claire, do you have them? Yeah, we have. Um, thanks, Gerald. Thanks very much. Claire, shall I, shall I leap in with, with the first one? We've got lots of questions in there. Oh, this really is where I get, I get dangled like a fish on a hook and I have to try and answer off the, off the cuff. Okay. <laughs> You'll be fine, Gerald. The first one is a question that I think we've 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 probably come across before, um, and and someone's asked, um, you know, in a, in a response, you know, you met, we you know we talk about reflection. You mentioned about reflection and what could have been done differently, but I think there's a concern that you know might that leave the doctor exposed to um, escalation or complaint or, or further complaint or, or litigation. You know, could it be used against the doctor if they reflect on on what they've done? This is a, a huge worry, I think, and I, I think there's a lot of, of misinformation out there. Um, a lot of it has come from the Balagarba case specifically, which I'm not going to rehearse here. It wasn't an MDU case. When um, something goes wrong, and if a doctor is unlucky enough to end up in front of the, the GMC, for instance, um, with a complaint, then evidence that the doctor has recognised the complaint, has uh, remediated from that position, has learned and shared that learning with others, is going to be positive for a doctor, not negative for a doctor. So it will not have a negative impact on them. I, um, in all the GMC cases, and Sam and Claire, you, I hope, back me up on this. We, we see doctors' remediation all the time. We know that the GMC expect to see it and are if they do see it, they tend to um, be reassured that the doctor has taken things on properly. So I think it would be 
um, I've got no experience of it ever being used against a doctor. Um, and it's always been a very positive thing in my experience. And it's what's, what in generally closes things down. So if you have something going wrong, reflect early, reflect well, demonstrate the learning. And that is what will be useful at the end of the day with the GMC. If you haven't done that and it goes to the GMC and then you do it the night before a tribunal hearing, then it's going to be much, much less useful um, when they know that you're coming to a tribunal. I would agree very much with that, Jared. So it, showing your reflection early and, and detailing that in your response is not only useful if it, if it escalates outside the organisation that you work in, but it's also a very powerful way to say it to the complainant, I've heard your concern, I have acted on that. And looking at CPD or undertaking you know, courses in related areas is, is not in any way the same way as accepting liability or saying that you have done something terribly wrong. What you're saying is, I've heard a concern, I'm a good reflective practitioner, I've acted on that concern. And that, that's a way of telling the complainant, I've heard you, which is really important in a complaint response. Um, it also goes for NHS England as well, of course, because GPs, unlike the hospital, well, hospital doctors will have at times within disciplinary processes, but uh, GPs may have their practice reviewed by NHS England and again demonstrating to the performance advisory group of NHS England and, and hopefully not the, the, the PLDP, um, would demonstrate that you've undertaken appropriate reflection learning and moved on from it and changed practice. It's going to be protected rather than anything else. I think in terms of reflection, what you're not going to put in your reflection is something different from what's elsewhere. What you're not going to put in your reflection is if I had done this, you would have definitely that definitely wouldn't have happened. Um, I think there is I can there is a slight concern sometimes about um the way that information is written in responses. Um, it, that might indicate some degree of liability, but that is incredibly uncommon. And that's one of the reasons we're here to, to look at what people write. Um, but in general, uh, saying sorry appropriately does not, re does not result in, in um, uh, ramifications for the doctor. Absolutely. Okay. Thank you. Um, the, the next set of questions I'm going to kind of um, amalgamate. There have been loads and loads of questions that use words like unfounded, unreasonable, vexatious complaints um, and doctors asking and practice managers asking how to approach those. They are of course particularly difficult to manage and a subsidiary kind of question, Jared, as to at what point can a doctor draw a line under complaints like this, particularly if a response is issued and the patient just does not accept the explanation. Yeah. That's probably the easiest, the easiest one to address first of all, is if you've addressed all the issues within a complaint and you say your complaint is not upheld, we've got nothing further to add, you just say that. The complainant then has to go to uh, the, the Ombudsman for secondary review of that complaint. So if the issues have all been addressed, and that's often the difficulty of making sure you've actually addressed everything. That, because as I said, when talking about complaints, often they're badly written, often they're handwritten, uh, sometimes the patients are not well when they're writing them. They can be incredibly difficult to read and understand exactly what they're getting at. The meeting can be helpful to clarify that, going through the pen, underlining the important things that have to be responded to. But once you've done that, once you've answered everything, if they're not happy, then you've done what you need to do, which is, is respond. In terms of the difficult complaint behaviour, I think we probably see quite a lot of that because we have doctors and practice managers and consultants in private practice at the end of their tether because they've had repeated uh, complaints on the same points from people who aren't just who just aren't listening. Yeah. And there is guidance out there about how, at least specifically within NHS England, about how to respond or, or uh, unacceptable behaviour from complainants. Within a trust, I would expect the trust to look after a consultant or a trainee who's being harassed that way and actually be more robust in, in defending the doctor and saying, well, we've answered these things. Dr. X cannot respond further. Claire, I probably missed some aspect of that question out. There were quite a few things in there. No, no, I think that that, that answers it. I, I think they are a source of particular concern. They can be really difficult complainants to deal with as well as difficult complaints to deal with and they can be quite driven to get a point, a certain point across. And I, I agree, once you have addressed everything, you, you couldn't ever be asked 
to start readdressing the same concern continually once you, you, you've given your answer and you've had your meeting, I, I think it is time to say we, we unfortunately have not been able to resolve this. A correlation, isn't there, between obsessive health concerns Indeed. and obsessive complaint behaviour um, yes. and sometimes even possibly an underlying uh, psychological or psychiatric comorbidity which impacts upon their decision making and how they express themselves. And I think that remembering that these complaints will be reviewed potentially by other people who are also practitioners and understand what it's like to deal with patients like this means that the important thing is to be reasonable and to be seen to be reasonable with what's going on. It doesn't mean you have to send a 30-page response to a 30-page complaint. It does mean that you have to address the issues and once you've addressed them, say we've addressed this previously and if you keep getting the same thing back and you've said it's not upheld and you've addressed everything and you're sure of that, they're get, you may get to the point where you're not responding at all, but that's quite far down the line. Yeah. And just to say, this is something that we do see. So I'd really encourage if anyone finds themselves in a situation where they, you know, you know, talk to us as soon as you think, you know, you need some support because we can hopefully help you manage something. But it is quite difficult, I think, and quite stressful when people, you know, come back again and again and again. Yeah. Um, another um, another uh, um, question that's uh, come up here is. Um, is about I've just lost my place in my question list here. Um, if somebody said who's you know do it you know when it's a, a complaint um, in an organisation and they're, they're a hospital practitioner you know it goes to the manager and someone else writes a letter to the patient and you, you know that doctor might not actually know yeah, what's yeah. been sent. Um, and I, I'm not sure what you you say Claire and, and Gerard, but I certainly recommend to people that if you are not if you're in a big organisation and you're providing a response that sort of outlines your your involvement or say you don't work in an organization on a regular basis so maybe you're doing a locum job or something so your your contact is limited you know if you can you know obviously you know write your response to you know get it so that you're really really happy with it but also try and ask to see a draft of the response before it gets sent um and that obviously you can't compel an organization to do that but you know if you ask i think most organizations would would hopefully involve you then in seeing a letter before it goes out and you can just make sure that it accurately represents your position i'm sure gerald and claire do you have i, say, I think the, that's particularly important to the trainees in the audience particularly ones who are moving around because sometimes organizations decide that it's too much hassle to try and contact everyone because dr x has moved on that may be what they what they decide, but the, your part of that is to make sure they know where you are if they want to contact you. So updating them, if you're involved in a complaint, make sure that the, the hospital uh, or your practice know who you are. If you're a practice manager, alternatively, and you've got a GP locum who's part of the complaint or a partner who's moved elsewhere um, or salary doctor moved elsewhere, you do need to involve them because the next these doctors might hear about it is the GMC. Um, you want to make sure that they've had a chance as, as the experts who were on the spot at the time writing the notes to be involved in that. Absolutely. It can feel very isolating to, you know, to, to have a complaint anyway and, and, and it's really important to seek all the support you can get including your defence organisation but also your colleagues and, and you know, people have all dealt with these before and, and I would very much say use us um, as your support mechanism and, and involve people as much as you can, absolutely. Um, can I go on to the next set of questions and that is concerns, when complaints concern multiple specialties within a hospital team or even multiple organisations, Jared, is, are there any particular considerations with organising a response to those? Sure. So um, all, of the, all of the complaints regulations across the UK and Northern Ireland require um, uh, responses to a degree of coordination of responses. So if we take the NHS England um, uh, uh, regulations, um, responsible bodies have to cooperate and uh, the cooperation would be for instance that one would take the lead so it's often I guess that the, the hospital might take the lead if they're the majority of the care but if they're not the majority of the care then the practice might take the lead in that and go to the hospital for a response. Now there's often some difficulty in getting other organisations to cooperate. Um, I'm thinking about ambulance 
uh, ambulance trusts at times they can be very difficult I think to get a response from they, they don't seem to understand that they're obligated to, to do under the same regulations so there's an expectation that you will do again the important thing I think is to see demonstrate that you've tried to get that to happen keep evidence that you've you wrote to the, the hospital last them to be involved you wrote to the ambulance trust or their health visitors or the nursing staff saying we're asking or the district nurses should I say ask them to be involved um, within a trust the trust should be coordinating that. So it wouldn't be unusual, sorry, my speciality to have a complaint about the neurosurgeons, um, the neurologists, the physiotherapists, and the AE staff all in one complaint. Well, yes, that's difficult, but they all have to coordinate. The, the PALS team are there for that, and that's their job, um, you know, 37 hours a week or, or more, given the number of complaints that, that occur. Yeah, brilliant, thank you very much. Just to, I know we've only got a few minutes left, but I just wanted to, to um, um, ask one more question. It's, and it's, I suppose, touching on something that you mentioned. I know the focus has been on complaints to organisations, but there's a bit of concern. What does a doctor do if somebody reports and makes a complaint about them directly to the GMC? Yeah. OK, well, um, that does occur. And so, you know, every year the GMC gets about 8,000, nearly 9,000 complaints about doctors out of whatever, 311,000 doctors on the on the medical register. So it does occur from time to time. The GMC, the chance of the GMC are going to take a complaint forward for, to the investigation stage differs between different groups that report them. So if you're a if your complaint, if a complaint goes to the GMC through your responsible officer, then there's about 90 plus percent chance the GMC are going to investigate that. Um, if the complaint comes from um, uh, a member of the public, then it's a much, much lower um, uh, chance that they're going to actually investigate. But they do, from time to time, investigate it, particularly when they feel that the allegations are so serious that they can't ignore it. Now, a single clinical incident being reported to the GMC um, might spark what's called a provisional inquiry. It might be such that they want to gather more information. but um, if it's a single clinical incident, there's no other concerns about the doctor's practice. Um, no one, the employer doesn't have any concerns, and the um, GP or the hospital expert working for the GMC doesn't think much of the of the issues in a complaint. Then it's not likely to to go forward. What you should do um, uh, is get some help. Is not communicate with the GMC about it yourself because that often makes it worse, especially when you're angry or scared or annoyed or can't believe it and can't believe they're doing this to you. That is the sort of correspondence that goes badly with the GMC. That's when you use your GMC, uh, use your MDU advisor uh, and get some help with that because that is what we are here for. Absolutely. Have we run out of time for questions? How can, can we fit in a quick 30 second one, Jared? I think so. I think we can do 30 seconds. I can't promise my response will be 30 seconds. Really quick, it is just about their uh, the timelines for responses. I think some practices seem to have their own uh, self imposed deadlines, and it's just to clarify the actual NHS complaints procedure deadlines for responding to a complaint. Well, as, uh, as you know, I mean, it varies between the countries of the UK. So that's the first thing to say, that staying within England, there is no specific deadline for, for responding to it. But you do need to communicate with them with complaints about if there's going to be significant delays within it, uh, within the complaint process. So certainly going out saying, first of all, we're responding in 10 days. Well, you're making it, making it worse for yourself. You're not obligated to do that. Um, uh, so um, don't give yourself an unattainable thing and uh, complaints the important thing is to communicate about how long you think it will take and to update them if it's not going to time. Brilliant. Thank you for that very succinct answer. I think we're at time. So many questions. Okay. Is that us? For, well, thank you very much for, for joining us. I really appreciate you coming out at lunchtime. Um, do remember to have a look at the resources that we've got online. There's lots of them. Uh, and do remember to um, fill in the feedback so we can change things around if that's going to be more helpful for you. Give me some feedback, the idea about having some practice workshops for practice managers, the practice managers in the audience. And um, uh, hopefully we'll see you again for a different presentation. Have a nice day.